Um, I'm going to call uh, this meeting of the Air Quality Management, Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management meeting uh, to order at 9 a.m. at May 26, 2022. If the clerk could please call the roll to establish quorum. Director Aquino? Here. Director Daniels? Here. And Director Desmond? Director Frost? Here. Chair Guetta? Here. Director Harris? Here. Vice Chair Kennedy? Here. Director Lalowi? Director Natoli? Director Papineau? Here. Director Serna? Here. Director Singh Allen? Director Terry? Here. Director Vang? We have quorum. Great, thank you very much, uh, Madam Clerk. Um, if uh, everyone could please uh, rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, Madam Clerk. If you could uh, please read the board clerk announcements. In compliance with directives of the State and Center for Disease Control and Prevention, the physical location of this meeting is close to the public, consistent with state and local officials' recommendation to promote social distancing and Assembly Bill 361. Members of the public are encouraged to participate in the meeting by observing the meeting in real time at metro14live.saccounty.gov Zoom video conference, conference line, and by submitting written comments electronically by email at boardclerk at airquality.org. Comments submitted in person will be delivered to the board of directors by staff. Public comments regarding matters under the jurisdiction of the board of directors will be acknowledged by the chairperson and accepted into the adjournment of the meeting, distributed to the board of directors and included in the record. This meeting of the Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District is cablecast live without interruption on Metro Cable 14, the Local Government Affairs Channel on Comcast, Consolidated Communications, and AT&T U-verse Cable System. This meeting is being closed captioned and we webcast at metro14live.saccounty.gov. Today's meeting will be repeated on Monday, May 30th, 2022 at 2 p.m. on Channel 14. Great, thank you, Madam Clerk. And uh, before we get here onto the next item's agenda, I wanna thank everyone for being here. Um, if you go to spareoftheyear.com or airquality.org, you can check our, our AQI of the day and the previous day. And yesterday was hot. I know it because I was walking uh, all afternoon and uh, it was 97 yesterday. And as you could tell with the ozone, when the heat goes up, today we're at 58. AQI, uh, and uh, as we get to the weekend, it's cooling down, so we'll be in, in the good range, approximating about 50. So with that, I uh, want to thank everyone for joining us for this Air Quality Management Board meeting, and we'll start off uh, with our first uh, item of business, Madam Clerk. The first item on the agenda is the consent calendar. Item number one, Assembly Bill 361 Compliance, Remote Meetings During Declared Emergency. Item number two, April 28th, 2022, Board of Director Meeting Minutes. Item number three, cancellation of the June 23rd, 2022, Board of Director Meeting. Item number four, contract amendment with Breathe California, Sacramento Region for the, for the Our Community Car Share Program. And item number five, side agreement with Sacramento Air District Employees Association for on-call on duty and callback pay. Great, thank you, Madam Clerk. Madam Clerk, do we have any members of the public signed up to speak? No, we do not. Then let me bring this back to the board. Are there uh, questions or comments or an, um, an action from the board here? Move approval of the consent calendar. It's, second, Terry. It's been uh, properly moved by board member Daniels and seconded by board member Terry. Uh, any other questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, Madam Clerk, if you could please call the roll. Director Aquino. 
Aye. Director Daniels? Aye. Director Desmond? Director Frost? Aye. Chair Guetta? Aye. Director Harris? Aye. Vice Chair Kennedy? Aye. Director Lalowi? Director Natoli? Director Papineau? Aye. Director Cerna? Aye. Director Singh Allen? Director Terry? Aye. Director Vang? Yes. The consent calendar passes. Great, thank you, Madam Clerk. We'll go ahead and move on to our next item, Madam Clerk. The next item on the agenda is the Air Pollution Control Officer Report. Give me one second and I will pull it up for you guys. I have Alberto Ayala on the line to give the presentation. Good morning again, board. Um, thank you for, for being with us. We have a couple of um, important action items for you on the agenda today. So um, I'm gonna try to get through the APCR report uh, fairly quickly, but there are, there are some, some few pieces of um, information that we definitely wanna share with you. Next slide, please. So um, we're sharing this, this NASCAR type letter with you because um, as you can see, it's a large coalition uh, and we are a part of, and what this uh, coalition is doing, led by CalETC, the California Electric Transportation Coalition, a uh, long standing uh, organization uh, pushing for uh, support for uh, EVs and the infrastructure that is necessary for those EVs. Uh, we recently submitted a letter uh, to the governor and the leadership asking for funding to support the infrastructure that is needed to meet the state's uh, no more gas combustion uh, uh, car uh, goals. And um, I wanna share a couple of nuggets of important information for you all, because I know that we all get involved and navigate this space of uh, you know, going all EVs and what sort of infrastructure we need. Um, the coalition did a, a pretty uh, useful uh, analysis. And um, what they came up with is um, over the next 10 years, uh, we need, $20 billion in state uh, investment to reach our full electrification goals. And these are useful numbers because we often get asked the question, I, I know you do, you probably wonder, you know, how much is it needed um, uh, and, and over how long a period of time. So I, I wanted to share the, this, uh, these numbers with you because I think it's pretty useful just to put things in perspective. So again, the analysis that the coalition conducted for this letter suggests that over the next 10 years, we need a total of $20 billion in investment for infrastructure, give and take, obviously. Um, the next piece of information is of the 20 million billion, you have 5 billion in um, uh, public investment and the rest is going to be um, uh, private uh, capital. Um, and uh, this, is, this is important because again, this points to the very significant investment from the private enterprise that is already happening. And when we think about what we see at places like the California Mobility Center and all those companies that are ready to go, um, this is where that money is coming from, from the private investors, the innovators that are ready to take uh, advantage of this growing green technology. So anyways, I wanted to share those a uh, couple of uh, bits of information with you, because uh, I know this is often a question that people like us get asked by folks um, like you. So next slide, please. So now we're gonna get into a bit of the weeds of uh, the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. And the reason we're bringing this item uh, to you is because this is something that we need you to be aware of. Um, as you know, the name of the game for air agencies across the state and the nation is we have to meet the National Ambient Air Quality Standards. These are set by the federal government, specifically EPA. The standards uh, cover the pollutants that are shown in my graphic here. Uh, there is namely for us, uh, particulate matter and ozone pollution, the one that is of greatest concern. That is not necessarily the case across the country, but for us, those are the things that we really keep a close eye on. When a region like Sacramento is in non-attainment of these federal standards, we get a label and these are called the designations. And the designations really are indicators of just how far a region is from meeting these standards. Uh, once we get designated, then the clock starts ticking and that pushes us 
to develop these air quality uh, management plan or state implementation plans that you'll hear us um, talk about often. Um, and then the cycle repeats because every five years per the Federal Clean Air Act, more or less, every five years, EPA is supposed to revisit the national ambient air quality standards to make sure that they are still reflected, reflective of the best science uh, and the most protective uh, levels for public health, okay? So the reason I'm bringing this, this, this uh, discussion is because our region is about to be designated as severe non-attainment. So next slide, please. Now, when I talk about the region, when it comes to air quality planning, uh, I wanna remind you that we are, we are a five air district region, the so-called Sacramento Federal Non-Attainment Area. And this is something that um, we pay close attention to because it makes us work very closely with our partners around the region. Um, and you can see the, the four air districts that we work with, Placer, uh, Yolo Solano, El Dorado, and um, Feather River up in Yuba County. So our region is in the process of getting designated with our full support, we are fully behind this as a severe non-attainment. Now, what does that mean? That means we have until 2032 to reach attainment. And um, the plan that we're gonna bring you later this year, probably towards the fall, um, we're gonna be running late, we're not gonna make the, make the deadline, but it's an issue of resources and timing. But the plan we're gonna bring you later this year is going to be essentially the playbook for how we are going to reach the ambient air quality standards, specifically for ozone, which is our biggest pollution headache by 2032. So again, the reason I'm bringing this item to you is I want you to be aware there may be some uh, press coverage. Uh, you may hear about this. It is, it's not um, controversial. It's not, this is pretty much standard process for EPA to designate the regions. And again, we are going to be put on, uh, the label on us is gonna be severe non-attainment, which again, is fine. It's, it's, it's just the clock that it starts ticking. And, and again, 2032 is what we need to keep in mind. Um, Next slide, obviously, if you have any questions on any of this, I will we'll pause at the end and, and please ask. Um, the next one is speaking of, of attainment and, and air quality and pollution. Um, per your direction, uh, last, last time we talked about the, uh, the, the Sacramento Bee coverage uh, in, res in response to the American Lung Association uh, report, um, we did work with our uh, five air districts, uh, the ones in, in the non-attainment area, we issue a press uh, advisory, a press statement that to my surprise got a lot of play and in a good way, because I think we were able to successfully uh, make our point that um, the American Lung Association report and, and some of the media reporting around it uh, really wasn't a balanced reporting in terms of where the whole region is. And again, I wanna thank you for, for your support, for your direction. Um, the, the statement is, is posted, the clerk uh, sent you a link uh, with it. Um, and what I wanna acknowledge is uh, at this point, our uh, communications office, uh, our two colleagues there, uh, Jamie Arno and Emily Altshouse, uh, they are the ones really that uh, deserve the credit for getting the media, the local media uh, to pay attention to the other side of the coin when it comes to the uh, the issue of where we are with respect to um, attainment and pollution in, in the region. Um, next slide. And then this is my last point. This is again um, to invite you to put this on your calendar if you're uh, open. Um, we are uh, co-sponsoring. We are one of many co-sponsors, but as a local agency, we're gonna be giving the welcome to the attendees for the California Hydrogen Leadership Summit. This is an important uh, gathering because the reason we're having it here is we're targeting our state elected officials. And this is gonna be an anything and everything related to hydrogen discussion. Um, obviously, this is something that, as you have heard before, this is important for our, our agency, this is important for our region. Um, we think that this can be a really sustainable zero emission solution for some of the applications where perhaps uh, batteries may not be best suited, but fuel cells and, and renewable hydrogen, hydrogen might. Uh, we're going to be at the, um, at the uh, Sheraton Hotel here, and as one, one of the co-sponsors, if you're interested, uh, we can get you access to the meeting. So again, I just wanted to, um, to make you aware that this is happening, uh, and stay tuned because um, with some of the federal investment that is happening uh, on many things, and 
several things related to electrification of, of the vehicle sector. Um, we're also working regionally to try to position the region to take advantage of some of the investment from the feds, specifically for the hydrogen hubs and some of the hydrogen economy uh, technologies that the federal government is expected to be supporting across the nation soon. So with that, let me, I know I cover a lot. We, it's a diversity of topics, uh, but I'll pause now. Um, and with the chair's uh, permission, we'll entertain uh, questions and comments. Any uh, uh, questions or comments uh, here? We go. Uh, uh, Board Member Daniels. Thank you. Um, I'll take them in reverse. I'm very excited to see the hydrogen conference thing come up. Um, uh, I would like to attend that, but I might be busy that day. But um, we'll see. And uh, but very glad. I think that's really the future. Uh, and I and I wish we would focus more towards that than um, uh, electric because I just think that. Uh, I think we're just going to have more and more problems with electric as we look for a way to put 40 million people in electric cars. But um, and then on the uh, American Lung Association response, thank you very much for that. It really disappoints me that an organization like that, who I would consider a partner with us in what we try to do on this air board, um, would would you know um, publish something that requires us to have to come back and clarify that. So. Very disappointing to see that, uh, but um, I'm very happy to see a response. And then finally, um, on the, uh, the the severe non-attainment um, category, uh, it, it just I just find that very disappointing too, because there are so many different factors in the Sacramento Valley region that contribute to you know negative air here, and um, I, I feel that you know you, you see different things you see waivers of certain things uh, because of uh, other circumstances when the feds put out guidelines or the state puts out guidelines and i just hope that in the end we don't burden our taxpayers our residents for a lot of things that are beyond our control and um, um and in that <clears throat> process of responding to that designation i'm hopeful that um that the, the organization can also factor in and, and have it be relevant um, of the, the bowl that we live in basically. Um, and that um, again, things that are happening beyond our control outside of our area and influencing our air um, are things that we should not be punished for. Um, and, um, and so uh, hopefully you can <clears throat> keep that in somebody's mind. Thank you. Thank you, Director Daniels. Let me, uh, I see uh, Director Harris's hand up here. Director Harris. Thank you, Chair Guerra. Alberto, we talk a lot about particulates. It's been a while since we talked about what is the most significant or, or who are the most significant contributors to the ozone non-attainment. So if you could just kind of briefly sketch that out, I'd be appreciative. I'd be happy to, uh, Director Harris, and thank you for the question. And actually, I can I can uh, tie it to the comments from uh, Director Daniels because um, so I'll I'll also take it in reverse. Uh, Director Daniels, your your uh, expressions uh, align very well with the sentiment from us, and I can tell you most local and state agencies. And where I'm getting with this is we are pushing with your help. Uh, and again, we joined the 155 other air agencies across the nation. We need to push the federal government to also control the sources of pollution for which we don't have the authority. And, and this is getting to the question for Director Harris. When it comes to ozone pollution, transportation sector is going to be the biggest source because the transportation sector, the tailpipes of our vehicles and equipment are the ones that are going to contribute the precursors that form the ozone, which we are so far in non-attainment of the standards. So uh, from that respect, uh, it's a, um, a two-way process where you know, we do have to go up per the federal government through this planning process. Uh, let me remind you that the reason we need an approved plan is not only because it's important for public health, but also for the region to be eligible for federal transportation dollars. Uh, our friends at SACOG need our approved SIP for that. So there's a, there's a double layer of, of necessity here. But to your point, Director Harris, it's, it's essentially a fossil fuel combustion. I mean, if you think of anything that you put into an engine and you're gonna get something useful out of it and it's gonna be reliant on fossil fuel combustion, that's gonna be the headache that, uh, that we're gonna have to deal with. And the last point I'll make about uh, Director Daniel's point is, 
I get, I get your point and, and the frustration is shared, but it's gonna get tougher. And the reason for that is because the same EPA is at the moment thinking of lowering these ambient air quality standards that we all need to meet. And it's not a done deal. We're gonna bring you back that information, but I just wanna make sure that I manage your expectations because uh, this is certainly not going to be the last time that you hear us talk about these issues. So thank you for the questions. Yeah, and I just wanted to um, make a comment here for our directors. Yesterday at Regional SAN, we took, I think, what was a very significant decision after a lengthy discussion of uh, Director Cerna here in the Air District made a motion to widen the RFQ, RFP process for a biogen plant, a very expensive project at Regional SAN, which was by staff mostly dedicated to burning biogas uh, in engine technology to create electricity, meaning that there would have been particulate byproducts and uh, damaging to air quality. The discussion was about including the possibility of using fuel cell technology in a tried generation mode to create green hydrogen and lower the emissions to virtually zero. Uh, a really robust discussion. Eventually, the regional sand board directed staff through Mr. Cerna's motion to open up the possibility to, al to allow fuel cell providers uh, to be able to bid on the project. I think this is really significant change in thought mode. You know, we have older technologies, basically human beings burn everything, right? And it's because we combust almost everything for our daily lives that we find ourselves in this problem with our air quality and frankly, global warming. So uh, I think a very significant uh, change of course, and uh, I'm happy to have participated in that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Board Member Harris. Uh, Board Member Aquino. So just kind of a basic question for Dr. Ayala. I understand the severe non-attainment designation, but do we have a designation now and are we being downgraded? Um, yes, there's an existing designation that goes with every standard. And right now, the reason we're bringing this to you is we're bringing the, we're bringing the designation from serious to severe. Okay. Things are getting worse. So um, we are in um, farther away from where we need to be meeting the standards. Now, let me give you some comfort level. This is more a technicality. Obviously, the air pollution doesn't change with a label, but it's a technicality because it matters uh, when we have to submit our air quality plan. So the deadline would, would impact us. And, and to Director uh, Harris's point, I mean, it, it, it is, I cannot overemphasize to you how important it is for us to have a plan that is approvable because if, if we don't, or if, if it's deficient in some way, it is gonna trigger a number of, of issues, including potentially additional fees on the very businesses that Director Daniels is, is speaking concern about. And we share the concern. At the same time, the rules are the rules. And you all know, it's unlikely we're gonna see any changes to the Federal Clean Air Act. So um, I'm just, uh, trying to bring you as a ba as balance a discussion of some very important issues as I can, but I do want to make sure that you are fully um, have a good grasp of of the implications of what we're talking about. But again, the, the label is going to be severe. Obviously, we're not the, you know we're not the San Joaquin Valley that is extreme. Uh, we we are not going to go there. We we thankfully don't need to go there. Um, but um, but again, it does trigger this 2032 deadline. That's the key. Um, Okay, thank you. Thank you, Board Member Aquino. Board Member Laloi. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair. Dr. Ayola, I have a question. Um, with, with all this work and commitment that obviously your um, office is committed to, and we are definitely in supportive, um, is your office in communication with the different cities? And obviously, as you know, our governor has has kind of ordered this dense uh, building and kind of filling up every inch of our city. So is your office in, in communication with the planning department, right? Or, you know, kind of consulting them as if there is an area that has the worst air quality in the city, is that 
you know, and they want to, they're approving 300, 400 units to go within this very specific community. Is there a direct communication between you and the planning department? And are they asking for your, for your office's comments and feedbacks about these projects? Thank you, uh, Director Lodoi. Very good question. So the short answer is yes. Um, I'll remind you as well that um, one of the functions, the responsibilities that we have as an air agency is to participate in the CEQA process and the engagement and commenting on these plans that you, in, as part of your jurisdictions, are, are approving. So uh, absolutely, uh, when those uh, developments get discussed and, and go through the approval process, our agency has a, has a clear role and we take that responsibility very serious. Now, I wanna address your question specifically about different pollution across the, uh, the region. Luckily, thanks to some of the research that this agency has conducted in the past, we have a good understanding that in our region, there aren't these hot spots of pollution, meaning the pollution is not worse and concentrated in one area versus, versus another. It's pretty regionally distributed. So that helps us because again, we're all in this together, right? And we all have the same bad air, but no one is breathing worse air than, than others. Now, on the question about infield development, I think you, you spoke about density. Um, that is a responsibility of our friends at SACOG. And it is also a climate change policy requirement from the state. And that's why we often talk about reducing vehicle related emissions at the same time we reduce vehicle miles traveled, meaning vehicle use. So that is one of the reasons that we um, are building a very strong partnership with our sister agencies because you know transportation, as I say, is the glue that brings us together. We just come at it from different angles. So I hope that uh, that answers your question. And um, Mr. Chair, if, if you would allow us, um, as we entertain Director um, uh, uh, Terry's question, I also wanna make sure that I give opportunity to, to, to our staff um, to maybe add anything that, that I might have missed on any of the topics um, that, that we cover. So we have our full uh, complement of our uh, senior managers here. So thank you. I know uh, definitely if there's anything missing in that question, please feel free. I do want to remind our team that we do have to we have a, a budget action uh, that I'd like to make sure we have a quorum for before before the end of this. But, uh, yeah, Trigger, if, if I could, I, I, I just want to echo what Dr. Ayala said and uh, reinforce the fact that in my city, at least, there have been multiple um, meetings that I have sat in with our planning staff and air district staff where they were very aware of certain things that they had concerns with around standards and other things, whether it was shade trees or um, other things that we were doing as we were going through the planning process. And, and our, our staff, the air district, um, does a fantastic job in working with my city's planning staff. So I just want to point out that from my experience, they've been doing a fantastic job for the last 10 years. Uh, thank you, uh, Board Member Terry, um, and uh, and I would probably and I would say say the same thing for the City of Sacramento here. Uh, uh, is there any comments from the staff uh, regarding that question about uh, coordination with our cities? Sure, yeah, I just uh, this was my level. So I oversee the Transportation and Climate Change Division, which um, we have the land use section under our division, and so we have a history of a relationship with all the local jurisdictions in in commenting and supporting a lot of the, the urban infill, uh, as Director Terry has mentioned, in, in supporting um, urban growth, but with it in a way that, that minimizes the, the impact on, on climate. And we have a really good relationship with all staff. And so there we have a, um, a process in which we comment on many of the large projects that every jurisdiction is pushing forward. So. Um, I just wanted to add that that it's been a, a long, for many, many years, we've had this process in place. Thank you very, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Lemos. Um, and um, uh, I, I would just close with a couple of these since I see no hands raised. A couple, one, uh, if you can't make the hydrogen uh, conference, uh, you know, one thing that I've discussed with our um, air pollution control officer is to do a tour of uh, the hydrogen facility over in West Sacramento that we're involved with, uh, with the new locomotive. That'll be a good opportunity for us to discuss also the multiple things we're involved with in the hydrogen field. Um, the Air District has been in, in, in conversations with Regional Sanitation uh, District to make sure that we look at 
this as a viable option. Obviously, we have a mobility hub where we have hydrogen, uh, where we're working with uh, some hydrogen sedans, so hydrogen vehicles are part of our mobility hub. Uh, and then looking at what our overall uh, infrastructure needs are for that to be a, a, an option. So when we get that put together, uh, we definitely will be inviting the board for uh, an, a, a time where we as a board, for those, uh, of course, uh, with uh, Brown Act rules and everything, uh, 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 could uh, discuss these issues as well on site at a facility. Uh, but with that, uh, I will say also that uh, even as the feds change, our air district has done a tremendous amount of work working with the other four districts in partnership uh, because we're all affected by it. And uh, e even uh, before the pandemic uh, and even this last time, when we do go lobby the federal government, it is a unified voice of the air districts of how each of us are doing our part to, uh, to work together to support our, our, uh, our, our friends in Placer up who are facing the fires and they, uh, us, who face the impacts of the smoke as well. So I want to thank our staff for that uh, robust discussion here with the APSCO report, uh, but uh, more more to do here. So uh, with that, um, it's sure. yeah, Can I just, yes, go ahead, I Board just, Member Daniels. Yeah, I just need a clarifying point from uh, the doctor. You used, you used the terminology, I believe you said, things are getting worse. Um, my question is, um, are you saying that the air is getting worse, or it's my understanding that the standards are just getting stricter, and so maybe we're further from the standards. Um, and I'm reminded, and maybe I'm confusing this, but I thought it was under the Obama administration that standards changed, and now we're further away from that standard. So am I confusing those things, um, or is the air, are you saying that the air is getting worse? No, I'm, I'm sorry, a poor choice of words, uh, Director Daniels. The standards are gonna get more stringent. And my reference to the five-year cycle is irrespective of who's in the White House, the Federal Clean Air Act requires EPA to every year, every five years or so, take a look at the existing approved national ambient air quality standards. And if you follow the history over the 50 years of the Clean Air Act, it's happened often that those standards get more and more stringent. And my reference to getting worse is our job is gonna get more difficult because uh, here we are contemplating the current standards, and we're already hearing from EPA that they may be imposing more stringent standards. I want to be fair to EPA. The reason they're doing that is because the health science is suggesting that we need lower standards. So we, we also um, understand that. So hopefully that clarifies it. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Good, good clarifying question, Board Member Daniels. Appreciate that. Okay, Madam Clerk. The next item on the calendar is the discussion calendar. Item number six, investing millions in the regional transition to green technology. And I have Rafe Porter and Christian Dampier on the line to give a presentation. Uh, good morning, board. Uh, Rafe Porter, I'm the program manager of the Transportation and Climate Change Division here at the Air District. And I'm actually gonna kick it straight over to Christian. He's gonna provide the presentation and I'll wrap it up. Well, good morning, board. Um, this is actually very fortuitous because we were just talking about the issues facing our region, and I am going to be able to tell you some of the innovative strategies we've identified to address these, these issues. The next slide, please. So for this presentation, we've got $11 million that we've identified for some major initiatives in the region. Uh, we can routinely compete with other agencies for state and other funds for our clean air projects. The funds are primarily to fund uh, decarbonization efforts in the region. However, there are a lot of good co-benefits that come from these district investments, uh, public health, economic development jobs, green tech, public awareness. And one of the nice things like we, we talked about earlier is it does complement other regional efforts that keep us at the table, keep us a part of the air quality discussion. Next slide. So one of the areas that we've identified is the zero emission electric school buses. Uh, this has been a very popular program. It's brought a lot of attention to the air district, uh, rightfully so, because it's a great way to not only promote zero emission technology, but put it into the communities where it's impacting sensitive receptors the most. Uh, for this item, we have two applications for Twin Rivers and Dry Creek, uh, about four, four and a half million dollars for both projects. 
It is part of our strategy to uh, transition the Sacramento school bus fleet to zero emission over the next uh, several years. And it is a partnership with both SMUD and the ARB to leverage the EV charger funds for our project. Next slide. One of the other strategies that we're working on is uh, compressed natural gas, often referred to as CNG. Uh, we do have one application for uh, a facility at McClellan Park. Um, it's actually gonna be part of the US Foods Complex, if you're familiar with it up there. Uh, that's gonna be $2 million and it's gonna use 100% renewable natural gas. We're supporting it because it is something we can do immediately to support some of the cleanest trucks available. And that also does help small businesses get into cleaner vehicles um, with a very low barrier of entry. And the nice thing, especially since we were talking about meeting our ozone standards, it currently CNG is 90% cleaner than the cleanest diesel trucks available. So this is something we can do today that really gets community benefit. Next slide. Uh, one of the things tying into the discussions about hydrogen, we are working with First Element to deploy a rather large public hydrogen station in Sacramento. We're looking for about four and a half million dollars, and it would be the first station in the region that not only supports cars, but trucks and transit buses. And the project can use current and future locally produced renewable hydrogen, and we are leveraging both CEC and ARB funding on this project. Next slide. So here is a map of uh, the stations that we're talking about. Uh, currently, we actually do have some decent sites out there. We've got three hydrogen stations, um, one in West Sacramento, uh, one at Watt and Fair Oaks, and the other one is at Greenback and Auburn. And those are light duty stations. We also have several CNG stations that are open for trucks. Um, in Elk Grove, uh, Florin Perkins area. And we are now gonna be adding additional hydrogen stations. Uh, we're working with Shell to deploy a station in Folsom and also a station in South Sacramento. And the hydrogen project, the, the new hydrogen project is currently looking near McClellan. However, we're in discussions with the applicant to see if there might be a more strategic location to put that station to better suit the needs of the region. Um, and this other interesting station that is gonna be opening up very soon, we're working with Clean Energy to open a CNG station in West Sacramento, um, right there where Usually the traffic jams start when you're heading west, um, right where the causeway starts in West Sacramento. And that's gonna support not only um, the West Sacramento fleets, but a lot of our regional fleets. So with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Rafe to sort of wrap up the policy discussion for this. We'll move to the next slide, please. So uh, these four projects are actually part of a larger, um, our ongoing incentive solicitation where we are continuing to focus on moving to the cleanest technology out there with a focus and trying to move as much as possible towards zero emission. Uh, but Christian did a great job of outlining that um, it's not always zero emission that we're moving to and, and CNG is a, a great alternative. It does have considerably less tailpipe emissions than a lot of the technology out there and it is readily, readily available. One of the issues that we've seen with some of the um, zero emission technology is it can be a little bit slower to actually get um, on the road. We do want to continue to support it and we will continue to support it both from the vehicle and the infrastructure side. But CNG is a great transition as we move, <clears throat> excuse me, more into zero emission, um, especially for some of the smaller businesses that we're starting to work with in trying to get them to transition their fleets into this cleaner technology. It, it is a lower um, barrier of entry. Um, for that. And so we are um, going to continue, to, as I said, to push on all of this and demonstrate that these technologies are viable and, and moving forward. So that's not only in these four projects that we have, but as I mentioned, our ongoing <clears throat> incentive solicitations that we have, and we will be having another one opening up probably later this summer. Next slide, please. 
So this item is actually looking for action. So that's to authorize the APCO to enter into um, agreements um, using the low emission vehicle incentive program. Um, we're looking to um, work with Twin Rivers Unified School District in an amount not to exceed 3.2 million, Dry Creek Joint Elementary School District not to exceed 1.28 million, uh, Beyond Six not to exceed um, $2,046,730, and first element fuels in an amount not to exceed $4,531,836 for, um, for fueling infrastructure. So um, that's the end of our presentation. We're happy to take any questions or an action at this time. Thank you. Uh, very good. Let me first uh, you know, thank the staff for all this work. Uh, I appreciate, uh, you know, at least you know, from an engineer standpoint, uh, that, we, uh, we're, that we not focus on one technology that we that be technology specific and allow us to figure out how we can best achieve our goal. How do we ensure that we're looking at the maximum opportunity? Uh, and we know somebody else will be have a brighter idea in the future too. So, um, and uh, and then there's some good technologies that are already uh, helping us adjust as as we fine fine tune this technology. So, uh, with that, Madam Clerk, do we have any members of the public signed up to speak on this item? No, Chair, we do not. All right. Let me bring this back to the board here for a uh, action. Um, and uh, again, I want to just thank how the level of success in the heavy duty side uh, on, uh, on this. I know um, uh, the light duty and the small vehicles are, are, there's a market for that now, but on the heavy duty side, I think this is a, a critical piece for us. Uh, board Member Harris. Chair, I'd like to move approval of the item. Thank you, Board Member Harris. Second. Second, Terry. Been seconded by Board Member Daniels there. Sorry, uh, Board Member Terry. Board Member Daniels, reach to the punch. Uh, is there any further discussion? Seeing that, I'd just Matt like to say, Chair, just let me let me say real quick. Uh, I can't think of a better way to spend our money than on this kind of thing. That you, uh, nothing worse than a bunch of kids rolling around in a bus that's gassing them, and um, um, putting our money towards uh, this is a way <coughs> to uh, spend our dollars. I, I would agree, Board Member Daniels. I think all of us remember those uh, the old <laughs> buses where <laughs> we were. I think we we're getting gassed while we you were didn't driving. Sit in the so. back. <laughs> so uh, uh, with that, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Director Aquino? Aye. Director Daniels? Aye. Director Desmond? Director Frost? Aye. Chair Guetta? Aye. And Director Harris? Aye. Uh, Vice Chair Kennedy? Aye. Director Lalowie? Uh, Director, Director Natoli had to step off. Too. Okay. okay. Uh, Director Natoli. Director Papinel. Aye. Director Serna. Aye. Director Singh Allen. Director Terry. Aye. Director Vang. Yes. Uh, this item passes. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, our next item here, um, uh, just uh, for reference, I think we've, we've brought the budget here multiple times and had a robust discussion about this. Uh, obviously, this is the fine tuning in our final hearing for the budget here. Uh, I do want to thank our staff for a lot of this. So, uh, uh, Madam Clerk. Uh, the next item on the public hearing is item number seven, fiscal year 2022 to 2023 proposed budget and fee schedule. And I have Patty Kepner on the line to give the presentation. Okay, good morning, Chair Gare and board members. My name is Patty Kepner. I'm the controller for the district. Uh, today, I'm pleased to present a summary of the fiscal year 22-23 proposed budget and fee schedule. This is the second of two public hearings that are required, and I'm going to start with a recap of the April meeting. Next slide, please. So uh, last month, uh, we took a look in more detail at the budget for each of our three funds. Uh, which is the general fund, the proprietary fund, which is our building, administrative building, and the special revenue fund, which houses our incentives. We looked at the five-year forecast for each of those funds with special emphasis on the general fund, which uh, continues to show a structural deficit over the forecast period. Um, and uh, we also looked at the proposed fee schedule, which it has a CPI adjustment of 5.65% an increase, and that's uh, composed of a 4% index 
a change based on our standard index, and then 1.65% of a carryover of the fiscal year 2021 20, uh, uh, fee increase uh, phased in, deferred one year, and then phased in over two years per board direction. There's been no changes to the budget since the April meeting, and there were no items to follow up on from the April meeting uh, to come back and report on at this meeting. So um, with that, uh, we're going to be recommending today that the board uh, do final approval of the fiscal year 22-23 budget and fee schedule. So next slide, please. Just a refresher, uh, this is the proposed budget for the funds. So we show our uh, three funds there in the first column, the general, proprietary, and special revenue. Then we show revenue and expenditures and whether there's a fund balance source or use um, for the year. So in the general fund, we do have expenditures exceeding revenues in the budget, and we will be proposing using $1.7 million of fund balance uh, to balance that budget. And we do have adequate reserves to fund the budget for next year out of, uh, out of the reserves, and we are in uh, compliance with the district's uh, reserve policy at the end of fiscal year 22-23. The Coville building uh, is a break-even fund and the special revenue fund. Uh, what you see here is we have uh, 33 million of revenues coming in and 50 million of incentive expenditures being dispersed. And so that's a use of about 16.7 million of fund balance, which is a good thing. That means we're getting the incentives like the ones that were just um, reviewed. Um, uh, out the door to the community. So um, that is the overall budget. And I'll just take a quick quick look on the next slide on headcount. Next slide, please. Uh, so our headcount here, just to, to refresh you, this is the uh, five-year trend in actual proposed headcount, uh, actually pro uh, approved headcount that was in the budget. So in the three, the first three years there, you can see we're at about 98, 99 of approved headcount. It dropped down during COVID, uh, conservatively managing the headcount, not really uh, with the uncertainty that COVID brought all of us. Uh, and now for 22-23, we are uh, proposing increasing that by 3.5 positions, two, air two and a half air quality engineers and one administrative specialist. So it's really restoring our staffing levels to what they were um, five years ago. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide basically lays out um, the wide range of resources that the district relies upon to meet its goals and its overall mission. And so it's very self-explanatory here, the type of resources that we rely on. But I did wanna point out that within the board item, uh, there is an attachment A, if you're interested, that has uh, additional details on each of these items, including the professional services, outlining some of the key contracts we have there. Uh, but as, as you can see, we, there's a lot of resources required, and we've got those adequately budgeted in next year's proposed budget. Next slide, please. So the summary here is our general fund for next year is balanced, and we're doing that with accumulated reserves still being within our reserve policy. The five-year forecast has that structural deficit in the general fund, and, we're, and we will uh, continue to work with the board to identify and develop uh, ways to uh, bridge that gap. And then we do have the 5.65% CPI adjustment, two fees uh, that are allowed by our rules, and the, the, that, that increase will be effective July 1, 2022. Next slide, please. So with that, the recommendations are to open and close the public hearing on the 22-23 proposed budget and fee schedule, and then to adopt a resolution approving the fiscal year 22-23 district budget and the fee schedule uh, with the 5.65% CPI adjustment. Both of those would be effective July 1, 2022. Next slide, please. That completes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Patty. Appreciate mm -hmm. that. And again, I uh, appreciate the, the staff's uh, work over the last few years to uh, manage our, uh, our budget, even given the, the fact that uh, we don't get the same recovery uh, cost numbers from the state from the programs on the pass throughs and uh, being able to manage that, I think, is, is clear. So, uh, with that, uh, Madam Clerk, do we have any members of the public signed up to speak? No, Chair, we do not. Great. Let me bring this back to the board. Are there questions from the board? If not, I'll take a, an action. So moved, Terry. Been moved by Board Member Terry. Is there a second? Second, Frost. Has been seconded by board member Frost. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, Madam Clerk, if you could please call the roll. 
Director Aquino? Aye. Director Daniels? Aye. Director Desmond? Uh, Director Frost? Aye. Chair Guetta? Sorry, aye. Uh, Director Harris? Aye. Vice Chair Kennedy? Aye. Director Lalowie? Director Natoli? Director Papineau? Aye. Director Cerna? Aye. Director Singh Allen? Director Terry? Aye. Director Vang? Yes. This item passes as well. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Uh, uh, board members, that's the balance of our agenda. Um, Madam Clerk, uh, public comment? Not at this time, Chair. No members of the public signed up to meet to speak on items not on the agenda. Board member ideas, comments, and AB 1234 reports. Board member Harris. Yeah, Chair, you know, based on our budgets of the last few years, I, I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Ayala, do you plan to bring something back to this board to talk about increasing revenues for the district? It seems to me a good time to revitalize that discussion. Um, Yes, Director Harris, absolutely. And I think that's what uh, uh, Patty was alluding to, that um, at some point in time, once we fully come out of the pandemic and understand the trends and, and some of the legislation that is working its way through, uh, we will most definitely bring back the conversation with the board. It's, it's, it's necessary. I mean, there's the, the chair already alluded to. Um, the state is giving us mandates that are not fully funded. We're getting new things to do from the federal government and they're not fully funded. So something has got to give. So I appreciate the uh, teeing up the question, uh, Director Harris. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you very much, board member Harris. With that, I just want to thank again, everyone. Uh, you know, the summer uh, is always a tough year, because tough time because of the heat. Uh, ozone levels go up higher. It becomes much more difficult with folks who uh, have issues with uh, respiratory challenges and just the impact on our kids and lung development. So I do want to thank everyone. This is one of our public health agencies and thank you all for your commitment today. And that concludes our, uh, our work for the day. So uh, we're done before 10 o'clock, everybody. Thank you for being judicious with the time. Uh, and Madam Clerk, with that, we are adjourned at 9.52 a.m. Thank you. We'll see you all in July. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.